Version 4.7 was very explanatory. Uh, who am I kidding? We have more questions than answers right now. Dainslev did say something, finally, he actually answered our question from version 3.5, which is a miracle, but then we were buried beneath a ton of information from him, from Caliber, and from Lumine, and everything got so much complicated, and that's why I'm making this video. But first, this is a theory video. I will use information available in the game, but my theories and conclusions are not to be considered the official lore of the game, unless I got something right and it's confirmed in a later update of the game itself. With that out of the way, since we have a lot to talk about, let's start this video with our first topic of the day, Caribert and the Loom of Fate. Caribert's story begins with a cataclysm that transformed him into a hillager. Clothar Alberich, his father, went to Sumeru to concoct a forbidden medicine that would awaken Caribert's mind with the power of the God of Wisdom. The medicine didn't work, but Clothar and Lumine ended up in a unified nation building in the chasm that led them to this huge crystal chain to the roof. Through that crystal, we heard the sinner. He started talking to a person he defined as a flower, born in sin, yet pure, spotless. Back then, I was uncertain if the sinner was talking to either, since he saw him through that dream, to Lumine or to Clothar, although he didn't hear him at all. I now believe he was talking to Caribert, even though he wasn't present at the scene. The sinner told him that he should have become a transcendent one and reason beyond the fate bestowed upon him, which he did when he became the Loom of Fate, and then he used Abyssal Power to lift Caribert's curse. Lastly, the sinner said that he would have shed a tear at the end of time, which could be Caribert's complete disappearance we witnessed in version 4.7, but also the photo that either found in his pocket. This photo was taken by some unknown person using unknown means in a space that should no longer exist. Since we still remember about Caribur, the unknown photographer should be the sinner. In version 4.7 instead, apart from the fact that we were able to witness Clothar's story in version 3.5 because Caribur implanted those memories into Ether's mind, Caribur told us that he died when he was 8, so not long after his curse was lifted by the sinner. Clothar somehow learned about the Loom of Fate, probably while either slash Lumine was unconscious, and he told Caribur that to become the Loom of Fate, he needed extreme sorrow and pain like those he experienced when he became a hillager, but also the mental anguish when he regained his consciousness, hope and regret, and he probably hoped to go back to being a normal child when the curse was lifted, although he probably never felt regret, and a degree of abyssal power that defies comprehension, given to him by the sinner himself. At that point, Caribur met almost all those requirements, so Clothar sacrificed him. Caribur just set the device in motion because he couldn't truly become the Loom of Fate, and he died as a consequence, while a fragment of his consciousness entered the semi-completed Loom of Fate, where he matured alone into an illusory world of nothingness. Since the Loom of Fate wasn't complete, all Caribe could do with it was implanting fake memories into people's minds, which by the way could have been the result of that medicine that uses the power of the Dentro Archon. The true power of a fully functional Loom of Fate though is completely different. Once completed, it would lose the ability to implant memories and obtain the power to weave new ley lines of its own. It would acquire the power to change the entire world. But what does that really mean? To explain my theory about this, we should jump back to Dainsleth's first quest, because with our current knowledge, we can finally make sense of what we were told back then. In that quest, Dainsleth read the details of the Abyss Order's mission to build the Loom of Fate. It read, Engulf the faith of an enemy in flame. Remember this for later. The first stage of the plan required the corruption of Ozile, the overlord of the Vortex, the ancient god we defeated in Liyue, but we also learned that their attempts to corrupt Valin and Andreas were also part of the plan. Then they needed the eye of the first Phil Tiller, the core of the first ever Ruin Guard, because it didn't have any kind of restrictions in its combat abilities, and they needed it to completely transform Ozile's body. They wanted to attach Ozile's limbs to the defiled statue of the Seven, and put the core of the first Phil Tiller in the statue's hands, in order to construct a mechanized god with the power to topple the Divine Thrones of Celestia. So it seems that the Abyss Order needed different but specific kinds of powers to achieve their goal. 
It all started with Caribur's sacrifice, then a divine statue, a dragon sovereign, the body of a god, the consciousness of a dead god, and the core of the field tiller. I also believe they didn't go to the chasm just because Lumine told them to find a way to lift the curse, I think they also needed the powers from the fountain in the upside down city, so the power of the primordial unified nation, and who knows, maybe even the heart of Averius that Ryan daughter was looking for. Now that I've refreshed your memory, don't you think there's something odd? They needed Ozile's body, and we're talking about an ancient god that had been slumbering for 3000 years. That is until the Fatui manufactured fake sigils of permission to awaken it. Then they wanted to build a mechanized god with unrestricted powers granted to it by its core, which is awfully similar to the everlasting lord of arcane wisdom, another mechanized god with what we could define as unrestricted powers granted to it by the electronosis and its core. I don't know about you, but the Fatui are strangely involved, one way or another, in what the Abyss Order is trying to achieve. But are these the only similarities? Caribert told us that the Loom of Fate can weave new ley lines, that the existing ley lines are deeply entrenched in the planet, and that they cannot be extended nor substituted. The ley lines, as we all know, can be defined as Erman Soul's roots. All the information and memories of Tevat eventually go back to the ley lines and are sent to Ermansoul, where they are stored and reused. Considering that corrupting Ermansoul means destroying Tevat, we could easily state that Tevat can only exist thanks to Ermansoul. As such, it was most likely created by the Primordial One during the genesis of the microcosm of Tevat, and it sustains the quote-unquote reality that we are experiencing. If we think about it, the Primordial One was defined almost as a mechanical device by Novelette when he said that their functions were ruined in the War of Vengeance. Did the Abyss Order just build an artificial Primordial One? The completed Loom of Fate can create new ley lines, new roots so to speak, and if you put roots into the ground, a plant, or a tree in this case, would grow as a consequence. If the Abyss Order wants to change the entire world, then they might be trying to grow an Ermansoul of their own, and I don't think it's a coincidence that there was an Ermansoul looking tree in Caribur's consciousness. If they do grow another world tree, then Tevat would end up with two Ermansouls, two overlapping realities, and they obviously cannot exist at the same time. So what would be the easiest solution to solve this conundrum? I don't know, maybe burning down Ermansoul? You know, engulf the fate of the enemy in flame, as we said before. And lastly, if Caribur had to die to become the Loom of Fate, so his consciousness had to use a device from within, then doesn't this sound like both Project Stigma from Honkai Impact and what Sunday was trying to do in Penacony? I mean, Caribur would be the only person who needs to stay outside the dream in order to assure everything is working fine. So, could Tevat as a whole be a dream world inside the consciousness? Is it Finance's consciousness? Moving on, when it comes to the fairy tale Caribert told the Hillagers, he said that it was essentially the story of Kanria. After the Cataclysm, the people left Kanria, the Shrouded Sun, and started living on the surface, the new world. They didn't need to think about anything anymore or dwell on their sufferings because they had been transformed. This transformation was the price they paid for what caused the Cataclysm, and their souls became cleansed and pure because they were deprived of their memories and of their consciousnesses. Then he says that they reclaimed an endless amount of time to love, which is the immortality of the curse seen from a positive point of view, and in the end they will all be cured of the curse. They will die as normal humans, just like his father did, and when they'll awake, so when they'll come back to life, they will be normal people just like anybody else. So from Caribert's perspective, the main goal of the Abyss Order is to lift the curse and allow the people to go back to the cycle of life and death. Lastly, in this chapter, we need to talk about a big, massive problem that comes with Caribert dying at 8 years old. Where did Kaya come from? He is a descendant of Clother Alberich, so he was his direct ancestor, but Caribert obviously didn't have the chance to have a child since he was a child himself when he died. I can only think of two possibilities here. 
Either Clother found another woman and had another child, but it sounds really odd considering he was buried with his wife in Sumeru, or they went the Honkai Impact route. In this case, considering the Caliber had the potential to become the Loom of Fate, but was only able to initiate it and use it in its semi-completed form, Clother may have cloned him with the same technique that Dottore uses to create segments of himself, which could be an old Kanrian technology by the way, and the clone continued the family tree and eventually Kaya was born. This would explain why Kaya looks very similar to Kaliber, maybe even the fact that his name sounds like Kiana, but also the fact that he is the last hope of Kanria. You are our only hope. This could be interpreted in two ways. Either Kaya is the one who can fully utilize the Loom of Fate, or considering that he was abandoned in Mondstadt to keep him safe, he could be the only one capable of stopping it. Now that we're done with the Loom of Fate, I think it's time to talk about the 5 Sinners of Kanria. Dainslev finally told us something useful after only almost 4 years, talk about taking a sweet time, and it's the names of the people behind the Cataclysm. Vedrefulnir, the Visionary, Hroptatir, the Wise, Rhyndorer, Gold, Surtalogi, the Foul, and Rerir, the Rehir of Solnary. Let's start as usual with their original names and who they are in game. Rhyndorer comes from Wagner's opera cycle Der Ring des Nibelungen, in which there are the Rhyme Maidens, three water nymphs usually considered as if they were one single entity, tasked with the protection of the Rhine Gold. They didn't really do a great job protecting this gold, it could be stolen from them if a certain condition was met, and it could be used to obtain war power. In Genshin Impact we know that she's during Elena's and Albedo's quote-unquote mother, meaning that she created them through alchemy and chemia. Vedrefulnir, as we said in the 4.2 analysis video, in the Norse mythology is the hawk sitting between the eyes of an unnamed eagle perched on top of the war tree Yggdrasil. In the Edda, the Old Norse textbook, it's never really explained why Vedrefulnir is sitting on the eagle, but it's theorized that it represents the wisdom of the eagle, so it flies around gathering knowledge and bringing it back to said eagle. In Genshin Impact, Vedrefulnir is Tainsla's elder brother, he's the sinner from Kariber, and he foretold the prophecy of Fontaine and drew it in the ruins from version 4.2. Now that we know a little bit more about him, I believe that he wasn't the crystal in the chasm, we simply heard his voice when we reached that place, just like Nicole usually talks to us. Surtalogi comes from Surtr, a Jotun, a Norse mythological being often at odds with the gods and other beings. He is the Garden of Muspelheimr, the Realm of Fire, and of Niflheimr, the Realm of Primordial Ice and Cold, where there was Hwergelmir, the wellspring from which all waters rise. Surtr will play a huge role during Ragnarok, when he will fight against one of the major gods, Froyr, and his flames will engulf the earth. In Genshin Impact, he is Kirk's master, he seems to stay in the Primordial Sea, which is more or less Niflheimr, more than he does on the surface, and he, for whatever reason, keeps an old Vary narwhal as a pet. His title, the Fowl, was also translated as the Extremely Evil Rider, or the Abominable Horseman, which makes him sound like one of the horsemen of the Apocalypse. Rerir is the son of Sigi, who in turn was one of the sons of Odin. Sigi was disposed of by his own brother-in-law, but Rerir ultimately avenged his father. Rerir's son, Volsung, was the forefather of the Volsung family, which included the hero Sigurd. When it comes to the title Rechia of Solnari, things are slightly more difficult. Rechia means Vindicator or Avenger, while Solnari may be the mix of two words, Sol, the Norse goddess of the sun, and Nari, one of Loki's sons from the Gildagining, the first part of the Prose Era, in which Nari was disposed of by his own brother. Solnari then could be interpreted as the son that died just like Nari, so a slain son. As a consequence, Rerir's whole title would mean the one who avenges the slain son. The second issue with his title is that in some languages, like Portuguese and Spanish, he is defined as the Vingador de Lua and El Cazador de la Luna, so the Avenger of the Moon, to be understood as someone who takes vengeance on the Moon, a Moon Hunter. 
So it seems to mean that Rarir is trying to avenge the slain sun by hunting the moon, which could mean that he's avenging the Eclipse Dynasty, the Dark Sun, the Shrared Sun, the Slain Sun by hunting the Prince of Moon. This is not exactly something new since Dane's left introduction talks about the eclipse being swallowed by the crimson moon or as it says in Chinese the red moon's revenge on the black sun. Hroptatir or Hroptar is basically one of the countless names of Odin, the main god from Norse mythology, who was described as a tall old man with a flowing beard and only one eye. In this case this specific name simply means wise. In Genshin Impact we don't really know anything about Roptatir, since this was the first time he was mentioned but if we take into consideration his Norse description, but also what I said in the previous chapter of this video, we do know one tall old man with beard and only one eye, Pierro. I mean think about it, he was the only one who realized that what Ehrman was doing was wrong, so we could say that he was the wisest of the core mages of Kanria. He decided to become a fool to mock the world and rewrite the rules of destiny, which is what the Abyss Order is essentially trying to do. He's been sending people into the Abyss to look for something, which at this point could be that crystal from Caribur. He had Child Awaken Ozile that the Abyss Order needed. He also had Dottore create the God of Arcane Wisdom, just like the Abyss Order tried to create their own mechanized god. The fact we define those who can challenge the world as the senders, and guess what? Surtalogi taught Skirk about the senders. And lastly, the Fatui will burn down Ermansoul. Of course, some of you will say that the Fatui do not align with the Abyss Order, but are we really sure about that? Even if you completely ignore these coincidences I've just told you, would it be the first time that we found out that something we believe to be an absolute truth was instead wrong, and the truth had simply been hidden for whatever important reason? I mean, we're talking about someone who joined the Tsaritsa to most likely pursue his own goal just like almost every single Harbinger. Why would Piero tell the Tsaritsa that he's secretly helping the Abyss Order? What would be the point of it being a secret anymore? Going back to the five sinners of Karia, Dainslev told us that they used to be exemplary people, they carried the hopes of the nation and that they were outstanding in their fields, meaning that each of them has a unique specialization. Ryan Daughter, for example, specializes in alchemy and even learned to create human life, the apex achievement of alchemy. Vedrefolnir can foresee the fate of all Tabat, he can read the fortune of the whole world, so his specialization is fate. Surtalogi most likely specializes in the Promorio Sea. If Raptorir is actually Pierro, then he would specialize in sorcery since he was a mage. While we don't really know a lot about Rarir, but considering that his title seems to be related to the Crimson Moon, he may specialize in the Abyss. We also learned that the five sinners were supposed to stop the Vinster King from shaking the foundation of the world. The Vinster King is kind of an enigma. The word Vinster comes from Old Germanic and it simply means dark, which is more or less what they intended in the game since in both Japanese and Chinese he is called kuro and Heiwang, and they both mean Black King. The problem is that in the other languages, Vinster is not translated and is not used as an adjective, but as a sort of name or title. Now it's obvious that this king is Ermen because he was deposed shortly after the Cataclysm happened and was replaced by the Albrecht clan, but considering that he was the king of the Eclipse dynasty that represents a dark or black sun, I could imagine that Vinster was simply the title given to the king of the black sun. Anyway, the five sinners eventually fell prey to the call of the abyss and acquired and divided among themselves a power that could destroy the world. This power transformed them into transcendent beings, something like human gods with war shattering powers. All of this happened before the Cataclysm happened, and it kinda reminds me of the letter we found in the Girl of the Sands, in which we read that the four pillars of Karia achieved the prosperity they had precisely thanks to the secrets from beyond the skies, which allowed their mechanisms to throw off the shackles imposed by the laws of this world. 
The only difference is that there are four pillars instead of five, so maybe one acquired those powers later, like Piero when he was cursed. Anyway, when the Cataclysm happened, the Sinners didn't try to stop the destruction, which honestly makes no sense unless they couldn't stop it at all or they actually wanted Caria to be destroyed. Could it be that the Cataclysm was the first step toward the construction of the Luma Fate, something that would allow them to acquire even greater powers? When it comes to Lumine, I think she's a huge hypocrite. I'm sorry, but she is. She was sad because she couldn't see Caribar one last time. She beat Dane's left to get the Eye of the Field Tiller, even when he hesitated to attack her. But above all, she wants to defeat the Heavenly Principles for what they've done to Caria, while she has no problem whatsoever with Clother sacrificing his 8 years old son to create the Loom of Fate. Really, Lumine? Who exactly deprived Caribar of his right to exist again? She's also working with the people who acquired world-shattering powers but did nothing to stop the Cataclysm, but she considers Dane's left to be evil for failing to stop the destruction of Caria. And she also knows that she's done something wrong in the pursuit of that final answer she's seeking. She knows she's at fault since she can face neither herself nor her brother. So she is ashamed of her doing, but still she keeps going forward despite it all. If you know me, this will sound very strange, but this time I choose to believe Dane's left. Furthermore, there's one thing that was extremely sus. She told us that we witnessed the Hydro Archon destroying her Divine Throne. How exactly does she know that? That's something only Nevelette really witnessed, not even either, and it was kept a secret. The only people who know about this are either Nevelette and Farina. We could think that she learned about Nevelet reclaiming his dragon authority, but even then, how does she know that? Even if Skirk told Surtologi what Nevelet told her and he then told his fellow sinners, Nevelet only said that Fossilor's divinity faded, so not that she destroyed her divine throne. Can Vedrafolnir see the fate of the world better than the Heavenly Principles themselves? Lumine then told us about the Heavenly Principles and the fact that they are slumbering, or at least that's what people believe they're doing. She said that Fossilor's actions could be used as proof of the Heavenly Principles situation because they didn't awake despite the fact that the destruction of the Divine Throne was a major violation of their rules, so not even Lumine is sure of what she's saying, she's basically theorizing. She doesn't even know when or what would trigger their awakening, but we can kinda guess when it will happen. And that's when Dottore will burn down Ermin's soul. I mean, if they don't wake up then, then they never will. Then we should also talk about the fact that she's the only person who calls the Traveler by his name, either. This is something that hit me when we first met her in version 1.4, but now it took on a whole different meaning. Either and Dainslev called the Abyss Twin by her name, Lumine, so there's no problem with that. But even though she called the Traveler Either in Liyue, no one has ever called him Either, not even Paimon who heard Lumine saying his name and is literally 24-7 with him. This reminds me of the one difference between the two siblings. One is part of the bat, the other isn't. When Lumine became part of Tevat, she was recorded by Ermansoul, she started really existing in Tevat. Either, on the other hand, doesn't really exist yet. His actions and their consequences have been recorded, because they caused a shift in the fate of the world. Things would have happened differently if he hadn't been there, but his name is something different. As it happens in many anime, a name isn't just a word to identify a person, it usually has some power behind it. The true name of a being that identifies their whole existence. Could it be that the same may be happening in Genshin Impact and the people can't remember or even learn his real name because it isn't recorded in Ermansoul? Could this be the reason why either goes by either the Traveler or the name we picked? Going back to the Loom of Fate for a second, Caribar needed it to be complete to give solace to the Hillagers. On the other hand, Lumine still doesn't know what to use the complete Loom of Fate for. This means that what the Abyss Order wants to do with it isn't related to Lumine at all, which brings back the concept of her being the princess, so there has to be a king or queen above her. And among the five sinners, I think it could be Rarir, the one who wants to avenge the Eclipse Dynasty. 
he may be the king of the abyss. I mean, if he's trying to replace the vast reality with his own, while also defeating the heavenly principles, he would be the best candidate. Lastly, Lumin told either about what he'll find at the end of the journey, the sea of flowers at the end. She said that when they were traveling from planet to planet, either wanted to find a place in the universe where that one flower was in full bloom. So we're talking about a specific kind of flower, not a random field of flowers. Lumin also said, Would you think of that as a coincidence? You mean... I miss you too, Ether. Why did she say that? It made no sense in that specific moment, unless the sea of flowers at the end is not an actual field of that specific flower, but it's a place that shows one's most important wish. In Lumin's case, that place reflected her feelings, her wish to be with either again, and it showed her the field he was looking for, it gave her what she needed to reunite with her brother. So yes, it wasn't a coincidence, it was intentional. In that specific place, you can witness the true nature of this world, an illusion, because... Fantasy can only survive with an underlying reality. Reality is the stillness buried deep beneath the illusion. This is eternity. Only through eternity are you closest to the heavenly principles. And that's it, I hope you liked the video. If you did, don't forget to leave a thumbs up, and if you're interested in catching Impact Theory videos, consider subscribing. I will probably see you again when the Imaginarium Theater finally comes out, because that will be a whole other mess to figure out, especially because the Hex and Circle are involved, and one of them is a Sinner of Caria. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, over and out.